Hello, so uh, Cedric Moreau. Um, I'm part of the uh, uh, Brian Garnier uh, healthcare team in corporate finance, and I'm uh, very uh, delighted and honored to uh, uh, chair the uh, cardiovascular uh, panel. Um, cardiovascular disease is uh, an area where uh, certainly we have uh, one of the most advanced and uh, exciting uh, cell therapy projects. Um, in, uh, in development. Um, think that thanks our experts and uh, welcome uh, uh, the experts today. I uh, think we'll go through uh, all the key uh, questions of uh, interest in terms of uh, clinical setting, manufacturing issues, and uh, all the challenges and opportunity. Um, but uh, before diving uh, into all these uh, matters and topics, I welcome my uh, uh, experts to uh, join me. And uh, I guess I think it will be uh, uh, very grateful if uh, you can introduce yourself and uh, maybe also mentioning uh, how you decided to uh, dedicate your, your experience and knowledge uh, cell therapy to this uh, uh, vital organ, which is the heart. And I think it's uh, uh, also an interesting, uh, uh, interesting point uh, to have your, uh, your uh, background on that. So please, with that. Uh, hi, I'm Adab Afar. I'm uh, coming to you from Mayo Clinic. I direct the cardiovascular regeneration program there. Uh, at Mayo, we have a significant interest in uh, regenerative medicine and have indeed uh, invested a lot of resources in uh, bringing this new technology to bear. Uh, as part of that program, uh, one of the earlier uh, uh, technological advances that we had at Mayo uh, led to the startup that you'll hear from later on today, Cardio 3 Biosciences, and we continue uh, that effort in innovation as we move forward. Mm -hmm. I'm Sylvia Tescu, I'm the CEO of Mesoblast. Uh, my background is in uh, cardiovascular medicine, stem cell biology, and immunology. Um, I founded Mesoblast about 10 years ago uh, as, a, as a result of um, really wanting to, to uh, develop a translational program in stem cell biology to predominantly cardiovascular medicine uh, and, and really the need to take um, clinical translation to really commercial development uh, require the establishment of Mesoblast as a, as a public company. And our focus is on allogeneic mesenchymal lineage cells that are scaled up, industrially manufactured, rigorously tested in, in large um, phase two and now phase three trials. And obviously our interest is uh, very much in, in the severe stages of congestive heart failure. Anthony, please. Uh, so I'm Anthony Mathra. I'm Director of Cardiology at uh, Barts Hospital here in London, which um, as of March will probably be the biggest cardiothoracic centre in Europe as part of uh, a, a big PFI. It's a great platform, obviously, to do this uh, type of research in patients with cardiovascular disease. Personally, I've got over 10 years of experience uh, of the autologous approach. I'm also Secretary of the European Society of Cardiology Task Force in Stem Cells in, in Cardiac Disease, and we wrote a position paper many years ago reflecting the, the need for uh, a defined approach uh, to this uh, highly exciting area. Um, I'm not associated uh, with a company, and one of the problems that we've <coughs> faced is that unfortunately our autologous approach appears to have been successful, and from an academic standpoint that uh, gives us or poses a tremendous problem because, of course, academia ends when phase two trials become positive. Uh, and the issue that we have is about trying to commercialize uh, and raise funds to conduct phase three trials. I also see the field that we have to be incredibly careful. There's been an awful lot of publicity, uh, perhaps not the best publicity, about stem cell therapy over the summer. And I think, um, as a group, we need to coalesce and put out a very positive message. So for me, today's discussion isn't about autologous versus allogeneic cells. It's about the challenges that we all face in trying to find the right solution for our patients. 
Yeah, for sure. It's uh, maybe one of the, the first questions I can ask you is that, uh, as you mentioned, Silvio we opted for a allogenic approach. Uh, we know that uh, Atta and uh, Cardios3 are connecting a more uh, autologous approach, so particularly on this cardiovascular field and cardiovascular disease. Uh, what can you say about these uh, plus and minus uh, pro and cons uh, approaches uh, and uh, what you observed also in your uh, research and, and uh, clinical trials? I can start first. Uh, so when we, when we think about allogenic and uh, autologous approaches uh, with regards to cardiovascular regeneration, at least in my mind, these aren't opposing forces. These are... Uh, different technologies that can be used to target heart disease at different times. Uh, if you want to acutely treat heart disease, autologous is essentially ridiculous, right? Because you need an acute therapy that's off the shelf and readily available. You can't wait six weeks for the patient's cells to be processed, tested, released, and given back to the patient. Uh, however, if you want a technology that uh, achieves a sustained phenomenon in the myocardium, whether you believe in engraftment or whether you believe that the cells are secreting something that's regenerating the heart, and you want that phenomenon to last for quite a while, you may want to opt for the autologous approach because the immune system is less likely to clear the, the patient's own cells versus an allogenic. Uh, there have been studies uh, to suggest that the allo approach, in particular with some of the bone marrow-derived stem cells like mesenchymal stem cells, may still uh, offer the sustained approach. May, uh, these cells may remain immunoprivileged at least for a period of time. Uh, but those are in the earlier phases of study. Uh, so these aren't opposing forces. I think that when we look at cardiovascular disease, it's a broad spectrum of disease from heart attack or acute uh, heart failures to chronic heart failures. And I think for each of these diseases, we need to find the right solution. So, so I might take a slightly different view. Um, I'm an immunologist by training, cardiovascular immunology. And um, the unique nature of mesenchymal lineage cells, in fact, is that they, they don't have co-stimulatory molecules. Mm -hmm. They secrete various factors that are clearly immunomodulatory. And extensive studies preclinically large animals and many hundreds of patients now using allogeneic cells, demonstrate that these cells do not induce significant immune responses. They clearly do not engraft, but they don't, do not induce in inflammation. And whatever they do in the, in the tissue results from release of paracrine factors and the cells die through senescence, not, not through removal by an inflammatory immune system. So therefore, we, our view is that whether you use allogeneic or autologous cells, there's no difference in terms of the safety or in terms of the prolongation of effect. Having said that, I think as a, as a commercial company, we've taken a view that we want to have a product that has very good batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility, mm -hmm. consistent release criteria, patient-to-patient, um, uh, -patient uh, identity, and, and the ability to, to do large phase three trials. We're, we're now in the middle of a 1,700 patient phase three trial in congestive heart failure. The ability to, to run a trial of that magnitude and to be able to interpret the results is very much dependent on the exact same type of criteria and uniformity of product as the pharmaceutical industry has, has, has established uh, over 100 years or, or more, meaning that if you want to, to be able to, to run large trials with, with, with significant endpoints, you need to be sure that the product that is being used doesn't have significant variability that, that emanates from the manufacturing process, number one, uh, or that emanates from donor to donor variability. And what we know about particularly mesenchymal lineage cells, well established in the literature, is that as, you, as one ages or as one develops degenerative diseases, the number and the quality of the mesenchymal lineage cell significantly deteriorates. And in fact, the very patients who need our therapies with end-stage heart disease probably have the least number of good quality mesenchymal lineage cells. Um, there, there have been a number of studies, most notably Josh Hare's study from, from Miami, showing outcomes 
with allogeneic versus autologous mm. mesenchymal linear cells are, are very comparable. But from the point of view of a rigorous, industrially manufactured process, which at the end of the day is not only important for regulatory approval, but is going to be even more important for widespread uptake and use of these cells, having a well-characterized, batched, reproducible product with release criteria and potency assays I think is going to be critical to, to uh, uh, long-term outcomes. And so maybe, Anthony, with your uh, academic uh, view and background, can you uh, uh, tell us more about um, the, the specific characteristic of uh, MSC versus more differentiated uh, cardiac cells and uh, how they can differ each, uh, each other? Probably being the least scientific on the panel, it's probably better I take a pragmatic approach to, to the data and speak on behalf of the, the clinical community to, to what's out there. So uh, I agree essentially with, with, with what's been said. And when I first started in the field, uh, the vision that I had was that autologous was the beginning and it would answer some of the questions such as delivery, a type of patient and the rest of it. And it would play by time for us to develop our allogeneic or other strategies. Uh, and the problem um, is that autologous, to some degree, have been a bit more successful than anticipated. Or more to the point, the allogeneic area hasn't been as successful um, as one would hope. But you could argue it's a, a different stage. And so the problem I see is the following. So firstly, in answer to the need to have a well-defined product, I totally agree. But that said, I'm the PI on a phase three clinical trial, BAMI, looking at the use of autologous cells in the treatment um, of acute myocardial infarction. It's a 3,000 patient study currently recruiting across Europe, funded by the EU. And trying to get regulatory approval brought all those specific points to the fore, and that what's your product and all the rest of it. But we were able to deal with that because you define the product on the manufacturing process and not the output, given the controversies as to, in the autologous, unfractionated group, exactly what is the, the key effect of cell, um, and those that also believe that actually it's a combination of cells that are achieving uh, an effect. Uh, the other elephant in the room that probably needs to be put to bed is whether you're talking about two, uh, true regeneration, in which you're trying to actually reproduce uh, or regrow uh, lost heart tissue, or, what, or whether you're talking about repair, which in a way is a salvage type thing. And I think what autologous has done in our, um, in our hands, and this is basically minimally, minimally, minimally manipulated cells, is um, understand that there is a potential repair mechanism that these cells can initiate that might lead to some degree of uh, restoration of function and some mm. improvement, and hence the results of the clinical trials. I don't really for one minute believe in the unfractionated autologous approach that we have true rate regeneration going on. I don't think that's what's happened. But it falls under the banner of regenerative medicine in that there is something else going on that is beneficial, that there is no other avenue at the moment um, uh, to actually uh, deliver. And so the problem I think we now face is that there is a bar that has been set by the results of autologous um, cell therapy. The data is, is um, there's a lot more data out there. Of, co of course, there's controversy associated with it. But the, the problem I have when I'm talking to audiences of cardiologists about this great therapy is what are the competing therapies that are out there? And when you put out the results of whether it's meta-analysis or individual trials, the first problem is that virtually nobody in the room bats an eyelid over this. They think, oh, well, that's not much change because we're using surrogate measures of outcome. Um, and to the average cardiologist, they, they're not particularly convinced by it. The second thing is that the community is not really cell therapy orientated. You know, cardiologists are either into drug therapies or to devices. So you're actually having to change the mindset of a community that's not really been expecting this type mm -hmm. of thing. And for us in the field, the changes that we see are actually significant. This is incredibly exciting. This is the beginning of something very important. A whole new field of medicine has started up. But it's difficult to get our, our clinical colleagues to, to see it. And so when you put the autologous data out and you look at the surrogate endpoints and you talk about a few percentage point differences in cardiac function, when you then add the allogeneic data on it and it again comes to a few percentage differences in cardiac function, your average cardiologist will say, so tell me the difference. And at the moment, the only difference you can say is, well, theoretically, it should be a lot better, uh, but unfortunately, it is associated with the manufacturing process and cost. 
So I think it's something that we have to deal, as a, deal with as a group with respect to perception to the cardiology community. But also, you know, I still go back to what I said at the beginning. I still foresaw that autologous was the first step to take us to the cleverer cells and to understanding how we do it. And we had to somehow break through into a very conservative mindset with respect to cell therapy. And I think autologous has done that. I said the slight problem that it's got is, uh, is the problem that allogeneic at the moment doesn't seem to have outstandingly better results than autologous. So, so, so I'd like to take, again, disagree with you. Um, <laughs> I think you can't talk about autologous versus allogeneic, broadly speaking. There's, there's, not, there's no such thing. I mean, what, what, what one needs to really think through is what is the cell type that is being delivered and what's the mechanism of action? Now, if, you, if you're delivering heterogeneous populations of cells, which by definition autologous and minimally manipulated do, then you really don't know what's the active cell, let alone what is the mechanism of action. I, I think you can take that approach, but you then become limited by what you don't know. And then when there are small differences in outcomes, you're limited by the questions you can then ask. The other, the other approach is to define your starting population very well and have a very well-defined cell type, homogeneous, well-characterized. Whether it's autologous or allogeneic doesn't really matter. It's the cell is defined as the product. And then you go down that path and, and define your outcomes based on the mechanism of action of the cell. So for example, mesenchymal lineage cells clearly secrete a range of paracrine factors that are completely different than uh, hematopoietic stem cells. They have characteristics around immunomodulation that hematopoietic cells do not, and therefore, hence the difference in being able to use one allogeneically and one autologously. Furthermore, hematopoietic cells cannot be expanded, so you're limited with what you're starting off with, whereas mesenchymal lineage cells can be greatly expanded. Now, the manufacturing process and the expansion process is very critical to what you finally, your final product is, but you have a well-defined product that can be characterized in, in vitro with appropriate animal models, et cetera, et cetera, with release criteria. If, if that is done well, then you have a cell type that can be tested rigorously around clinical outcomes. Um, your point about surrogates is, again, uh, I, I think a problem in the field that I think clinical trials need to now be looking well beyond surrogates at the kind of primary endpoints that the drug industry looks at. So our colleagues who, who are well used to small molecules or, or even devices and look at heart failure mace or look at ischemic mace, depending on what the outcome is, we've got to be testing the exact same barrier. Now, the issue around whether you do it with a 240-patient trial or a 3,000-patient trial is simply linked to the potency of your cells. So the more potent the cell type, the greater the treatment-related effect and therefore the smaller trial. The, the, the less potent the cell type, the smaller the difference, the, the many thousands of patients that need to be done. And I think it, it all comes back to what is the cell type, how well characterized is it, how well understood is the mechanism of action, and then you go in and build the clinical trials with endpoints that the, the clinicians understand to be relevant, the regulatory bodies understand to be relevant, and at the end of the day, it make a difference to patients. I th you know, on that point, because you had just talked about the the endpoints, uh, the, the, the clinical setting and design. And we observe that uh, when we are discussing with uh, European authorities and the US, they can have a different view and different endpoints. So how do you manage that? And uh, how do you see the, the evolution of the, the clinical setting and design uh, going forward? Um, so to answer this question, uh, but also maybe yeah. to continue uh, the comments that I made, I really do agree with the fact that you need to have an extraordinarily well-defined cell. I think that's of utmost importance, whether it's allo or autologous. And beyond that, what we're seeing uh, in our research and in developing this type of technology is that MSC, so mesenchymal stem cells, even when we take it from patients with orthopedic injury, so 18-year-olds, have a diversity in regenerative action when placed back in the heart. So it's not just you're getting it from a young guy versus an old guy that matters. Some patients have innately regenerative cells, some don't. And in order to create a cell that's fundamentally regenerative, you need to recondition these cells 
whether you select a very narrow bandwidth of uh, cells that you feel are regenerative and you can prove so, or whether you teach these cells to act in regenerative fashion, you need to recondition your cells such that they achieve a robust potency in cardiac regeneration. But what that provides an opportunity for is what I feel is the next step of regenerative medicine, cell-free. These cells secrete things. They essentially don't do much else than uh, act as a sponge for proteins that are released in sustained fashion. And so do we actually need the cells in the long term? So whether, you know, aloe manufacturing is still expensive, autologous even more so. So can we capture the basis of why these cells have a therapeutic impact and provide that to the heart? in extraordinarily uniform fashion now because it's off the shelf, cell free, and achieve the types of benefits that we're looking for. That's sort of where our technology at Mayo is going uh, towards. Uh, and I think as we design our trials, you know, we need to really achieve this type of uni uniformity. In regards to the FDA versus the EMA, at least in our experience, the FDA wants an endpoint, a singular endpoint that you can rely on, primary endpoint. Preferably, that's death. Yeah. Death or in the setting of heart failure, death and hospitalization, <laughs> secondary to heart failure, failure, surrogates of death such as transplants or uh, out of hospital arrest. In Europe, they're more expect accepting of composite endpoints. Okay. So they'll take VO2 max, treadmill times, how bad you feel, how good you feel, your ejection fraction, uh, and death. Uh, and you can combine all combine. of those uh, types of uh, endpoints to come up with, uh, with a trial here. So there's a big discrepancy uh, yeah. in terms of trial design. And what we typically do is have a similar design and have the primary endpoint be what the FDA agrees with. Whereas in Europe, we just have a composite endpoint. At least that's been our experience. I don't know what you yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think that the U.S. sets a, a very clear bar, which is no different whether it's cells or drugs. It has to be a mortality-linked endpoint in heart failure in any case, probably also in ischemic heart disease. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you have to power your trials based on a mortality-based endpoint. And if you're going to do that um, in a US-based trial, then you incorporate European sites because you've raised the bar as opposed to, to having two different endpoints. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I think if you were doing a Europe-only trial, your endpoints could be more based on surrogate endpoints. But I think, I, I think we, we, in order to, to convince the rest of the cardiovascular <laughs> community, I think we should be held to exactly the same bar yeah. as drug development. Um, I also want to sort of just touch back on the, the, the statement you made about cell-free mm -hmm. proteins, because our experience is actually a little bit different again. That, in fact, these, these are smart, smart cells. They're living cells. Mm -hmm. They respond to cues in, in the damaged tissue, and they release paracrine factors. But the factors that they release in vivo, actually, are quite different from the, the factors they release in vitro in the, the manufacturing vitro. process. Yeah. And, and in fact, what they release in vitro under artificial conditions probably is not even predictive of what they release in vivo. Now, we, we um, in fact, in, a, in our clinical trials, are finding that, in fact, the, the the subset of patients with the most advanced and severe disease appear to be most responsive to our cells. And I think what that's telling us uh, is, is that, in fact, the instructive cues to release the right cocktail of cytokines occurs in the situation where you've got damaged heart, heart muscle. And it's not just cardiac disease. That We're seeing the same thing in other diseases associated with inflammation. Now, if, if that's the case, then I think it's going to be very hard to duplicate um, a cocktail of factors that is, is released on cue. I, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't mean to suggest that I'm going to manufacture, you know, eight proteins, package them together and put them in the heart. I know, I recognize that it's a very complex biological system that we're trying to mimic uh, that changes significantly when I have it in a culture dish versus a beating heart versus a disease-beating heart, versus a very severely disease-beating heart. But um, 
our capability to assess for that biological influence is quite large. You know, we have a massive omics operation that is able to very easily characterize from the metabolomic to the proteomic to the myrnomic to the transcriptome of what happens to these cells in real time live. And in doing so, you can create an interactome. An interactome is essentially a complete biological picture of a cell as it transitions from your dish to the most severe state in heart failure. You can actually watch what happens to the insides of a cell using this type of interactome maps. And in doing so, you can essentially decide what is the most critical element in achieving regeneration. And then, if you take that and superimpose it on trials, in other words, what characteristics about my cells resulted in the best benefit in trials, then you're able to genuinely identify those unique molecular profiles that if put together in the secretome, mm -hmm. uh, that if put together and packaged correctly such that you get sustained release, could potentially mimic, and I'm not saying this is something I'll have tomorrow, but this is what we're working towards, could potentially mimic in very rigorous, very uniform fashion what we're achieving with cells today, but maybe in 2020 or 2025. Mm -hmm. Anthony, maybe a question for, for you. Um, Actually, sorry, can I just come yeah, back? Sure. I didn't get a chance to have an argument. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally get the scientific rationale, and I totally sign up to it. I think if we can choose a cell and test its efficacy, we have a, uh, an assay that allows us a release assay. It gives us quality control and all those, those issues. Um, I totally get all of that. Uh, the problem that, that I've got is that the mess of unfractionated autologous cells unfortunately has given us a result. And if you look at this from a purely clinical perspective, so in the NHS, I can go to um, a, most of the teaching hospitals in the UK and others that essentially have a bone marrow transplant unit, um, and I can get them to manufacture autologous cells as per the protocol that we're currently using. So the thing about this is that for what uh, currently appear to be similar results, I've got something that is immediately scalable. There's a defined protocol on how to do it, uh, and we know how to give it, and that limits the cost. Obviously, you guys that are working on a particular cell type through a company approach are investing tremendously in this and, often, and you know, will need to recover your costs. But I'm automatically at something that's cheaper. And the only point I was making was that I get all the scientific thing, but you'd have to sell it on that. It's the effect that's the problem. The thing is, autologous cells do have a positive effect. No, it has nothing, it has nothing to do with cost. It has to do entirely with effect size. So without doing randomized placebo-controlled phase three trials appropriately powered with a primary endpoint of mortality, there are no data for you to be able to say that results are the same. And, and it has <coughs> nothing to do with cost. It has to do with the quality of the cell the quality of the product, and the quality of the clinical trial outcomes. No, I agree, but we're talking about phase two. This is a field that has just evolving into phase three. Uh, and some of, well, you guys particularly are, we're all, in fact, just about involved in phase three. We're the first people to do this. And I agree, the answers rely on hard clinical outcomes. So I will answer that question in a minute as well. But what I'm just saying is that in the phase two, the problem is that it doesn't appear to be much discrimination, and you would argue but yeah, we're just looking at surrogate markers of effect. So I agree, if there's a massive difference in phase three between a selected cell type approach, uh, that is the end of the, of the, the unselected autologous approach. But, but that's the bar that's been set, and I guess that's what we have to wait for. Uh, and the answer to the type of trial, again, the immense skepticism, try and avoid composite endpoints. We have to have a very clear answer with the phase three trials that we design now because anything that's composite will come out with a, a tremendous amount of scrutiny from the field, uh, and it just needs to be a very pure approach. And therein is your ultimate limitation, that the composite, you know, the, the, the purest endpoint is mortality, and depending upon your, your patient population, you could be talking about very large studies and a tremendous amount of cost, but we you know, somehow need to raise the funds to do that, because these are really important. These are the, the key questions. Okay. Uh Maybe another topic. I don't know if you agree on, on this uh, on this topic, but uh, it'll be interesting to have your point of view on the place of the uh, administrations uh, of the cell.
um, the use of the potential new cell uh, uh, delivery methods, the way we infuse uh, the cells. So to have your, uh, your view on that and the, the challenge we have ahead and, uh, and uh, the, the way we can uh, still improve the efficacy, in, particularly in this cardiovascular field. So th this is actually an area that I'm very opinionated on. Um, so, Good. so unlike the rest of us. Uh, cell delivery is a very, very important uh, issue with regards to regenerative medicine or with regards to cell-based therapy. When to deliver it, where to deliver it, and how to deliver it, are, or even the cell dilution, are critical elements to what exactly the cells do. And in fact, if any of those steps aren't carefully selected and done correctly for each cell phenotype that we're considering, then any therapeutic effect that you might envisage may already be lost just because we messed up the cell delivery. Uh, we did this study a few years back simply looking at different approaches for cell delivery. One was intracoronary. There's some claims out there that if you deliver uh, cardiac derived stem cells, the CK population, down the coronary arteries, you get over 95% retention of the cell population in the heart. We got five uh, when we looked. Uh, and we did large animal studies, uh, you know, did it exactly the same way. We weren't able to get that. I'm not a huge believer in intracoronary cell delivery. Uh, unless we're talking about the paracrine modulation of the, of the conditioned medium that we're probably getting from uh, the, uh, the bone marrow mixture cells or the, uh, the mononuclear phase of the bone marrow in acute MI. That may be giving some immunomodulatory influence to the heart right after MI that could be beneficial. With regards to cell delivery to the heart otherwise, you can do it surgically or you can do it percutaneously. Surgically means you have the chest open and you're sticking the heart, the outside of the heart with a straight needle. Or you can do it percutaneously, which means much like an angiogram, you go through a large vessel in the body, get access to the inside of the left ventricle, and you inject. Um, we did both of those as well, and we got, within 10 minutes, 90% cell loss. Again, following the protocols of slow delivery, watching, you know, and with epicardial delivery, you can actually watch a bubble form you know, as, as you inject these. Uh, so what we ended up doing was reinventing the needle. If you take a straight needle and you stick it in a contracting tissue, right, you have mm. a straight line to mm. have your samples eject out and you have a high pressure system right in the middle of a contracting muscle. As soon as you remove that needle, all of your sample is essentially ejected right back up. In 10 minutes, you lose 90% of your sample. Uh, the approach we took was we curved the needle so you don't have a straight track out. And instead of having an end hole, we also added side holes. What, and this is using computer modeling. It's called Darcy's Law, if you guys want to look it up. Uh, but uh, essentially, what that does is it mimics an edema, right? So you essentially create an edema over the length of the needle to not really have this high pressure system at one point. And in doing so, we still lose about 50% of our sample in 10 minutes. But over five, 10 days a month, we get 40% of our sample still staying in the heart. So that's a 4x retention improvement uh, that we get that has huge implications of how many cells you could potentially need to deliver uh, and how you deliver your therapeutics. So, and these, this is all, all the stuff I'm telling you has been published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, so in this regard, whether we're talking about delivering of, uh, delivery of molecules or delivery of cells, you definitely want to get the biggest uh, bang for the amount of cells you're putting in. And so I think we need to carefully look and test fundamentally how these cells are in there and what they do once they get in there. So, so I, I, I'd like to touch on a couple of other things as well. I think it depends, again, on what cell type you're using because mm -hmm. one, one mode of delivery that you didn't touch on was intravenous. Absolutely right. Um, and so 
again, there are cells such as mesenchymal lineage cells that have unique homing properties that are able to find their way to specific tissues at a time when there is sufficient inflammatory signals to allow the cells to home there. And we take advantage of that with the mesenchymal cell that, again, does not, does not exist for other cell types in the same way, mm -hmm. where within a certain window of time, those cells are able to home to the inflamed myocardium, usually between day three to day 10, but not beyond that. At that point in time, you, you, you can get large numbers of cells homing to the damaged myocardium without the need for any, any kind of intracoronary or, or intramyocardial delivery. In contrast, of course, in the late stage of disease when you've got you know, chronic advanced heart failure, there are no inflammatory signals in the myocardium. So intravenous delivery of these cells doesn't get you anything. In that setting, the, the cells can be delivered, again, by a number of different ways, by catheters, et cetera. But, but the, the real issue there is that, again, a, is a regulatory question. The regulators, whether in the US or, or in Europe, um, will, will consider a cell type delivered with a particular catheter as a combination product. Yeah. And so uh, it becomes a really important question in designing trials as to whether, in, again, in my, in my view, the, the relevant outcome is driven by the cell, by the biologic, not by the catheter. But it, it's incumbent on, on the investigators to demonstrate that. So in the context of a large trial, a phase three trial, for example, if you want to have your cell used broadly by, by interventional cardiologists who use different kind of catheter types, then you've got to devise a st strategic trial design that tests more than one catheter. Otherwise, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a great outcome and your cell gets approved, it's going to be linked and approved to the catheter that it was tested with. And so we've got to get to the next level where you broaden the, the delivery device modality and demonstrate that they're effectively interchangeable and that it's the cell that's the critical uh, biologic uh, therapeutic. So I agree with uh, what's been said. The only other thing that to add is the, the nature of the patient. So if you're talking about an acute infarct patient, then potentially your method of cell delivery, delivery will change reflecting on the immediate state of that patient. So I think with the, the comments that we've heard, the delivery into the myocardium in the chronic heart failure patient who is stable and not in an acute inflammatory and ischemic situation. Uh, we have done a head-to-head -head in humans comparing intracoronary versus intramyocardial. The study wasn't directly powered to do that, but we got a signal in intramyocardial, we got no signal in intracoronary. So again, I think the evidence is stacking up to support what Atal said, that actually if you've got a chronic heart failure patient, particularly with blocked coronary arteries, the rationale for trying to inject it down a coronary artery is virtually non-existent now, um, and that we have to use these needle technologies and evolve them, because the first type of needle that we've had, as Atta said, is a straight needle, and it has all these issues to do with potentially falling out. For acute myocardial infarction, however, fiddling around with a needle in a beating heart <laughs> in a patient who might have a cardiac arrest is clearly not something we can do with current technology, even though it might lead to better engraftment. So really, I think for the time being, for acute myocardial infarction, if that is a target group, and there's a danger with acute myocardial infarction, and you could argue the biggest change has already been happened with primary angioplasty, and to knock further improvements off the mortality benefits you see from primary angioplasty using cell therapy is going to be a real challenge, and it might be that that's not the area you'd really want to invest in. The market's in chronic heart failure and trying to get that right. One key element here for, for AMI that I'd like to highlight is that when we look at the studies that have so far been done, uh, they've really looked at STEMI patients, so patients coming in with a severe heart attack, as a uniform population of patients. But when you actually follow these patients out, there's a subset of these patients that typically do terribly. That's why we have a heart failure mm -hmm. pandemic, right? Uh, and so if there was a modality by which you could differentiate those patients right up front, so as soon as they hit the cath lab, you may be able to find a niche population that could benefit from this acute delivery of cell therapies or any other regenerative therapies uh, that you devise. Uh, so we actually took that approach. We took this, uh, we took this question and... Uh, 
we, we've been able to identify a few unique proteins that are seen only in the blocked coronary arteries. So if you do a thrombus aspirate, you identify the absence of a few unique proteins, which uh, at almost 90% accuracy for sensitivity and specificity, we're doing the prospective study now, can predict who's going to have a terrible outcome. And so if you individualize the care, so stenting is an obvious thing. You need to open that artery. But then if you can create a bigger degree of resolution in the patient population that you're treating to identify not the 75, 80% who are going to walk out the door and start smoking again and you'll never hear from them, but that 20% that's going to become your patient and you're going to see them every three months, uh, if you can identify those 20% now, right at the time of opening up their artery, you may be able to develop technologies that genuinely will help that population. Not only that, your trials might become much more positive because you're selecting a very vulnerable cohort. And I think that as we go down the road of regenerative medicine, more and more we're going to have to identify these narrow population of patients where they could benefit not just from standard of care, but standard of care plus something new. I, th I couldn't agree with you more. I think the point you're making is about biomarkers. Absolutely. And, and identifying the segments of various diseases that uh, represent, A, the most um, recalcitrant patients, where standard of care just doesn't work where our technologies can make a big difference, right. and B, to your point, that I think it's the best way that we're going to segmentize and create programs that can, can be managed in a way that gets you outcomes in a defined time frame. I think it's uh, time to get some questions from the audience. So, Robin Davison, can I, can I just ask if you could address yourself to the, the, the sort of issue of the dose that you're actually giving in these studies? Because it, it does seem that we don't know a lot about the dose response in the, the two studies that have been cited, maybe others as well. And yet, you know, you are at this advanced stage. I mean, do, do, you, do we know that, you know, if you, don't, if you give more, it's not necessarily better? We, is the dose optimized, in your opinion, uh, for, for the, the, the ones that you're testing? I, I think with regards to dose, uh, it depends on the cell therapy that you're talking about. There's been several studies, in particular with the CD34 population, where they found lower doses are, there's sort of a bell-shaped curve, but once you hit uh, the top of that bell um, and you go beyond it, you actually get a lesser effect. Uh, and we saw that t this morning with some of the immune-based therapies as well. Uh, the way that we uh, uh, helped Cardio3 decide on the dose was really based on preclinical data. So you essentially uh, test the therapy in pig models uh, or other preclinical models, and you see what dose works best and what's the minimal therapeutic dose uh, that you can go with. The FDA and in smaller part, the EMA does ask for these big uh, carcinotoxico studies where you go well beyond uh, what you think is the therapeutic dose uh, to prove uh, safety. Uh, so I think, uh, I think the dosing is really sorted out for each cell phenotype simply based on the preclinical work that's done. In our case, we need a lot of cells, around 600 million, because that's in our in cardio 3 cell technology uh, that's that's what was found to really achieve the targeted paracrine influence to achieve reversal of heart failure um, in some other therapies they've used as low as although I don't buy using a million cells for the heart given that the heart has what eight billion cells um, but there are technologies and trials that have only used a million cells uh, so I think it just depends on what you get from your preclinical data. And maybe what, what about uh, uh, scaling uh, repeated administration? So, so uh, a question. Yeah, you want to address that? Um, well, so so I think I, I, I agree completely that I think the the cell type is critical. You can make no, no blanket statements about <laughs> cell dose. Each cell type 
has its own, will have its own kinetics, will have its own um, dosing requirements. And you can, and, and I agree that that the nice thing about cell therapy is that preclinical is very predictive mm -hmm. of clinical, and so you do a lot of dose ranging in preclinical to get the, the sort of range. But ultimately, you've got to do appropriate phase two trials that are dose ranging exactly the same way as the drug industry does. So we we test a range of um, at least three doses per indication because, again, for the phenotype of cells you're interested in, um, the outcomes are going to differ depending on the indication you're interested in as well. Um, so in, in, our, in our phase two trials of chronic heart failure patients, we've seen a sustained benefit for at least three years with a single dose. Single dose. Um, com complete prevention of, of heart failure, hospitalization or death, uh, particularly in patients with the largest volumes. And um, to date, we haven't needed repeat dosing. Now, again, I can't tell you whether a repeat dose would be useful or not, mm -hmm. but using that kind of an endpoint, uh, which I think is, is what, what the large trials need to be about, I, I think what, what's going on here with the kind of cells we're working with is that um, they, they appear to be able to reset the clock, if you like, in a, in a disease that if you can, can, can stabilize the progression of the disease, you might be able to reduce these kind of large um, endpoints, which are crude endpoints, right? Hospitalization or death is an incredibly crude endpoint. But, but the, the re relationship between surrogate endpoints or volume changes, et cetera, well established. And if what you're trying to do is to prevent recurrent hospitalization, you may not need more than a single dose for an extended period of time. question about um, the placebos that uh, you use because I understood that sometimes even the, the needle injuries, even, even small, can produce uh, mechanical somehow uh, responses that perhaps give a transient benefit. Do you inject uh, saline, for instance, in the same way? I can talk about, or if you want to talk about it. Yeah, for that specific reason, then uh, in the UK, we've been able to design placebo-controlled trials in which the placebo is either saline, but a full interventional procedure, whether it's intracoronary or intramyocardial, or, or sometimes we've used serum as a placebo, and you do tend to see an effect. Now, whether that's in the serum group, because you've got the paracrine factors in the serum, not sure, but uh, the injury model that you're alluding to uh, clearly has to be factored in because it might have an important role. Uh, there are examples of uh, placebos. Uh, since it's a procedure, uh, the patient does receive sedation. Uh, and in order to achieve double blind, the, the physician performing the procedure can't be blinded, obviously, in this setting. But um, what you can do is to design a study whereby you either inject the cells or you perform a sham procedure and you get access and you do everything except for poking the needle in, into the myocardium. Some people would suggest that that's safer. In other words, since there's no therapeutic benefit of just hitting the heart with a needle, uh, that the risk of that type of sham procedure uh, you know, is unethical, potentially, and I think that's at least been the message that the FDA has provided to us. So typically we'll play a movie of a sham procedure, we'll talk, you know, pretend like we're injecting the cells without actually doing it in the sham uh, versus not. But, but I think, I think the, the, the point is that um, th there have been trials in the past of, of laser, for example, yeah. and, and there's no evidence, in fact, that, that needle stick or, or, or trauma with laser does anything significantly in this patient population. So, you know, it's a theoretical possibility, but the, the, the past history of this, in fact, says the opposite, that simple needle stick um, or simple trauma doesn't, doesn't improve volumes, doesn't have any impact on major endpoints like hospitalization and death. So what we're talking about here is adding a procedure, which is, you know, with, with a needle plus a hopefully a biologic that, that's effective, on top of standard of care. Now, standard of care in these patients now 
is a cocktail of drugs, including the, you know, the recently, the re recently touted drug from Novartis that, that appears to have a major impact on, on heart failure patients. If you can then demonstrate over and above that with this procedure a major effect on, on these long-term outcomes, you, you've got something that's extremely Im important. And I think that the minimal potential additive benefit of a needle stick into the heart, I think, is, is negligible. I disagree. I mean, for phase two, I think it's important, but we're limited by our, our ethics committees. For phase three, yeah, you're comparing it to standard. You don't need to do that particular control arm. You're looking at, in a heart failure study, conventional treatment versus this invasive procedure in cells. But I think you do need to be a little bit careful because, unfortunately, we saw a signal in needle stick, um, and it, you know, it might attenuate the actual differences you see between a cell-treated and a placebo group. But still, we're all in phase three. Let's see what comes out of it. Let me can take a little, uh, one Alain, last question. Alain Bartoun, Suezalius Biocapital. So you talk about uh, FDA, EMEA. What about Japan? Seen the, the Nobel Prize, Yamanaka. I'm not talking about IPS, but mesenchymal my cells. Do you have some experience of trying Japan? Uh, it seems that it's very open now. Uh, do you think concussion cells will work, or do we need a specific trial? I know GCR is, is quite active there. Uh, so do you have uh, some, some experience there? Yeah, Japan is a very important um, uh, discussion right now. Uh, end of this month, we expect to hear from the Japanese um, uh, regulatory authorities a formal position, legal position, on, on what uh, it will take to get stem cell products conditionally approved in Japan. The, already, the Japanese government has created a new, a new class of medicines that are called regenerative medicines. They're not, they're not drugs, they're not devices, they're, they're unique. Um, and it is expected that um, they, they will be fast-tracked uh, for conditional approval in Japan. Uh, fast-tracking will, will mean that uh, on the basis of appropriately run and designed phase two trials uh, with safety and, and, and signals of efficacy, uh, that, that cell-based products will receive conditional approvals uh, and with, with the ability to then have a certain defined period of time to, to uh, execute appropriate phase three trials. But in the meanwhile, um, these, these products appropriately manufactured, appropriately uh, based on, on, on safety and early efficacy data will be potentially available for commercial use. Uh, I, think, I think Japan is a very unique country in that they've been really at the center of innovation with regards to stem cell biology as is evidenced by uh, Yamanaka's work, amongst others. And in particular, uh, in the eye, they've made some fantastic uh, new progress with use of IPS in, uh, in reconditioning or rejuvenating uh, the, the eye. Uh, I think Asia as a whole is a very unique opportunity to pursue. Uh, we or actually I should say cardio through at Mayo we we've been working with Japan and and with China uh, in large part to create uh, bigger bridges of academic and medical collaboration uh, in the form of e-consultation so doing video interviews with patients and uh, getting referral for very complex medical cases and that's provided a, a bridge to also um, move forward uh, some of these scientific advancements in the form of trials there. Uh, Cardio3, and they may touch on this later on, uh, now has partnership with um, a, f a firm and, and has created a joint venture whereby they're going to do a phase three trial in China um, to move forward uh, some of the technological platforms that they have going. So I think it's a very unique opportunity with a huge population and a big need in that space as well. So I think uh, we have to end the, the panel. Thanks very much, all, all those three guys, uh, for the very interesting uh, discussions. Thanks. Thanks.